no fail. It's just kind of bringing it back to like, hey man, what were you taught when you learned how to ride a bike? Having a flyer go off somewhere else is almost as serious as a pistol shot going off somewhere else. But I think because, I mean, the original weapon lights that were issued were like, what, 60 lumens or something like yep. that? Yeah. Hey everyone, Matt Lanford here with Primary and Secondary. Welcome to Modcast. It is episode 203. So you've been shot. It's a training AAR. Today is August 15th, 2019. I can't believe we're already in August, midway through even. Um, yeah, it's, it's going to start getting a little colder. People are going to be starting to change what they wear. They're going to change up what they carry. They might even carry additional medical things now. Kind of a firm believer in carrying the same thing no matter what the temperature is. I dress to carry a, a medical kit. I dress to carry a firearm and the supplemental equipment. Um, in some areas, that's just not possible. Where I live, I can. Um, so we're going to be talking about a, a training class. We're going to be talking about a medical training class with medical components, medical aspects. Uh, unfortunately, also concerning medical, it's just one of those things that you know, we can have all the cool guy training. There's a good possibility we'll never need it. Medical, however, there's a greater chance that we may need to use some medical things, whether it, and it's not, not necessarily just for us. It could be for a family member or a friend, or if you happen to be nearby for a traffic collision, which traffic collisions happen on a regular basis. Injuries happen on a regular basis. I, I, I know some people don't completely agree with this, this mindset, I'm a fan of being prepared. I'm a fan of being able to help people when they're in need because it is an absolute horrible feeling to be present for something catastrophic like this. So the worst day of someone's life and not being able to do anything to help them. So let's, let's talk, to, let's talk about some sponsors real quick before we start speaking of medical Filster. So Filster has some really cool medical stuff. Some, some things that make carrying tourniquets. Okay. Flat pack right here. Uh, tourniquets, various medical supplies, very easy. Um, I just recently went through an alert training. I just took an alert uh, training for the last couple of days, and we were talking about implementing various medical supplies on a un on a uniform, and still with stay within regulations of a police uniform. Some agencies are very strict in what you can have uh, visible on your uniform. Some need to be very streamlined. There's some solutions uh, Filster has that would allow a very compact package of a tourniquet and then also some of the additional medical supplies that can very easily go into a cargo pocket. So that was one of the things we discussed. So uh, on top of that, if you happen to be in the market for a, a holster that is ambidextrous, near universal, and compatible with an X300U or a TLR1 nowadays, that would be the Filster Floodlight. You should probably check it out. I have several. I like them. I have them set up for different different reasons, different purposes with different flex systems. It's nice to have variety. Um, also, big thank you to Facts on Firearms. My favorite example of Facts on Firearms in use is on InRange TV. They did the What Would Stoner Do project. And on that project, they use a Facts on pencil profile barrel. And at, at this time, I remember people were talking about pencil profile barrels being horrible and uh, you, you don't want to get something like that. It's just get it's something thicker. It's too thin. No, they, they work just fine. And if you happen to be in the market too, if you need spare parts, if you're building a new AR, if you need uh, pistol barrels, Faxon has them. They have a lot of stuff. As a matter of fact, with the, with the, with the barrels, they have AR barrels, AK barrels, uh, a lot of Smith barrels. Choose the, the caliber, the gas system, even the color. And they probably have it. Uh, also, big thank you to Walther Firearms. The episode is brought to you by the letters P, P, and Q. Seriously, if you haven't tried the PPQ yet, and if you're a firm believer in the Glock 19, try out the PPQ. Personally, out of the box, the trigger is better on the PPQ. The grip is just slightly larger, so my hand's not hanging off the, the end of it. <clears throat> it is a smooth action has everything I like and a, and an easy out of the box carry pistol. If you know me, I will be more than happy to take you out shooting. If you happen to live near a, or you go, <clears throat> you go to a gun range that has these available, check it out, rent it, shoot it. I, I think I can guarantee you'll, you'll enjoy it. And, uh, 
It's a very pleasant gun to shoot. But not only that, it's uh, surprisingly nice for as little attention as it gets. Lastly, big thank you to our Patreon subscribers. If you go to pay, uh, patreon.com slash primary and secondary, you can help support the network. And when I say help support the network, that also means you help us pay for all kinds of cool projects that we're doing. This big video shoot we just did in, in not in October, that's coming up. The big video shoot we did in July was sponsored by, by our Patreon subscribers. Basically, we were able to do a lot of really cool stuff. I'm still working on editing a lot of this video. Um, we had a lot of primary and secondary people come out. We had uh, Carl from InRange come out. And for three days straight, we were shooting and recording. We have some awesome content coming out still. Some of the content we already have out is absolutely amazing. Um, I'm really excited about having some of the, some of the additional new stuff. Um, some of the add on to what we've released. I kind of talked a little bit about some flashlight content that we're, we're, we're going to be working on to add on to the existing flashlight content that we've already uh, released. But again, big thank you to the Patreon subscribers. Make sure if you like this stuff, you give us a subscribe. Uh, yeah. Subscribe. Don't forget to also like and share because we appreciate that. Um, that also, that gives us an idea that we're doing good. On top of that, what especially helps is when you provide some feedback so we hear directly from you. Um, it helps us give, helps gives us an idea of what we're doing and where we can improve. So, my background's in law enforcement. My medical training is somewhat limited. I have gone through an EMT course. I found that I am truly a police officer and not any type of medical provider. Uh, I've also taken all kinds of basic first aid and I'm a firm believer in having medical on me at all times. It's helpful. It's helpful not only to me, but those around me um, because you never know when you may need it. And I, again, I'd hate to be in that situation where someone's in need and there's nothing I can do to help them because that's just in my nature. So let's go, let's continue with some intros. I think we should pick on other Matt. That's fair. Uh, my name's Matt. Uh, I live in the Chicagoland area. I've been training around for probably a little over two years now. Uh, funnily enough, that is what kickstarted my medical uh, class pursuit is I was going to general with some friends. We got into a car accident, relatively minor for everyone in our vehicle. The person who hit us was a little more banged up. Uh, and after getting her kind of, you know, she got out of the vehicle, we moved over to the side of the road. We got her to like sit down and that was the extent of my ability to help that woman. <laughs> so I was like, you know, this is uh, something I maybe should do, right? So then uh, Eric's class, I took it for the first time, um, got all the medical, figured I'd have some fun shooting while I got the medical and why not cover the skills of, you know, uh, learning to use my tools while injured and all that good stuff, self-aid, then buddy aid. Um, so this time around, I had a friend who's a cop who wanted to take it for his own personal betterment. And I decided I'd run it again. And this time, you know, the first time I did it with a Glock 17 with an RMR, probably made life about as easy as I could. This time I said I'd take it with a 43 with iron sights and, you know, really hate life. So cool. And so why do you have a rubber ducky behind you? <laughs> if you know about the watering hole in the duck pond, then you know. And if you don't know, you got things to find out. I have things to find out. <laughs> Dakota, you are up. Hey guys, Dakota Schaefer. Um, no cool background. I'm just a guy who likes to shoot and train. Been doing um, the shooting training stuff anyway for about the last five years and then relatively recently got into medical um, over the past year or so, I've taken a couple of medical classes, just the TCCC type stuff. I had done CPR and things like that before, but just two really basic stop to bleed classes. And, uh, man, that should be like the first thing you take, you know? And, uh, yeah. So just full disclosure here. Um, Eric actually invited me out as a guest this class, so I did not pay for my slot. So know that going into this thing. And, uh, uh, on, this, on the face, I just got to say, what a cool class merging the two. I think there's a lot of value there and it can help draw people in to get that medical experience with having that kind of, you know, sexy, insta cool range time, you know, which is very practical. So, uh, anyway, we'll get into all that. So, um, yeah, that's me guys. Cool. Eric. Yeah. So, um, actually, uh, both Matt and Dakota, um, didn't actually pay for the class. Matt's a returning student and 
as long as it allows, my returning students only have to pay their range fees. Um, that's something I like to do, encourage people to uh, come out and practice as often as possible. So, um, man, I ain't in it for the money. I'm in it to get the good information out. So, um, myself, I am the owner of Archetype of the Gun. Uh, I have been a paramedic for going on 20 years now, um, just shy of the 20 year mark. I have done literally everything in EMS and uh, the education world on that side. Uh, critical care, 911, fire department, private, all that stuff. That was my um, primary means of income until I medically retired from the Chicago Fire Department. Uh, been shooting my whole life. It uh, doesn't mean shit. Okay. Um, I started training seriously uh, shoot 2005-ish. So um, that's when I started taking my training seriously and really focusing on stuff. Uh, I offer a whole bunch of classes, CCW and um, beyond here in the Chicagoland area, and I host several other uh, instructors, um, Chuck Pressburg, Mark Freeborn, uh, Dave Spaulding. Um, man, if they're a quality instructor, I'm trying to get them out here. So uh, that's my company in a nutshell. What this class is. So I realized that I was having a hard time getting the average civilian to just sign up for a medical course. And I firmly believe that the average person will use their medical skills long before they will use their firearm. But firearms are what people focus on because that's what's sexy, right? Everyone likes to go out and shoot and everyone likes to go have a good time. They like to go to band camp. Um, but they're ignoring a huge aspect of it. Uh, and I found a lot of people that are just buying stuff because of the online community, but don't really have an understanding of what they're buying, how to use it, or they just have a basic. And that basic um, understanding of it is generally wrong. So um, I merged this class with some shooting to kind of bring them together and try to entice people in. The first four to six hours of this course, depending on student participation, because uh, I allow time for a lot of practice if they want and a lot of questions, because there's always questions about it once people get into it. Uh, lecture on the medical side. So this will get you your uh, TECC, civilian first responder is what I base it off of. I can adjust this to a higher level uh, depending on the student base. If it's a class for a bunch of cops, I'm going to bump it up to the le next notch of uh, guidelines from TECC um, for those with a duty to act. Uh, and I can do this all the way up to a 16 hour just medical course for EMS continuing education and stuff like that. Uh, the shooting component takes up the last uh, 12 hours or so of the class. And my premise for the shooting portion, as Chuck likes to joke, gun yoga. Um, there is a little bit of gun yoga in this class, but really what this class is on the shooting side is uh, it, it's, it's a guided self-discovery. I'm putting out multiple techniques and you're figuring out what works for you and what doesn't work for you. I teach skills. I don't teach tactics. I'm not law enforcement. I'm not military. Um, though I've been to those classes and I've assisted as an AI for those classes, I, I really got no business teaching them. Um, and your average uh, armed citizen They don't need tactics. You know, what you do in the event is going to be determined as the event unfolds. 
It's not like you're on a SWAT team with a pre-planned um, design going in. You know, you don't have a specific job. This, you're going to find all this on the fly. So I teach the skills. I don't teach tactics. Um, and along with the skills, I teach you problem solving. And I encourage it because we want to do the problem solving now and learn the skills now because we want to know how to fix those things and fight under these circumstances uh, and at least have some experience when, the, when something bad happens to us. So that's how I kind of brought everything together. Um, it's been getting, uh, people have been happy with it and I'm going to keep doing it, taking it on the road and doing it here in the Chicagoland area. Um, so that's a lot of it in a nutshell. I'm sure, I'm sure we'll get into more of it as this goes on. So, um, let's go ahead and, uh, move on to questions or we want to move on to, uh, student perspectives. I have a question for you. Yes. Uh, is there anything special a, a prospective student needs to do prior to attending the class? Or is there any different equipment list on your class versus a normal shooting class or medical class? Absolutely not. Um, I base this course off of potentially this being the next course someone would take after a concealed carry course. So the only thing that I require from my students is that they can safely use their holster, that they have good muzzle awareness and they have good trigger discipline. Those are the only three requirements I have for my students. I provide all the medical gear and um, I would prefer that you have some sort of um, quality firearms training, like uh, some sort of fighting pistol class from, from anybody, uh, Chuck, Dave Spaulding, Varg, uh, Matt Jaquit, anybody. Um, that would make things easier, but I, I changed the course based upon the student base. So uh, with this time around, everybody was a bunch of shooters. All right, Matt shoots competition. I'm mean, sorry, uh, Matt takes a ton of classes, Dakota shoots competition. We had another, two other firearms instructors in the class, one that owns his own company, one that teaches for somebody. I, I, think, the, uh, uh, I think Jeff, who's writing an AAR, um, and I think he's got like 2,000 hours of firearms training. Uh, we had one person in class that was, this was actually his second or third class. Uh, guys, do you remember what number class this was for Josh? No, no. I, I know that most people in there had uh, a decent amount of experience, it seemed. But the first time I took Eric's class, um, it was like the cap of a weekend where he had taken a couple people from Pistol 101 and the cap was, so you've been shot. So um, I've definitely seen both ends of the spectrum where there's the complete new person um, and then there's people who are there just looking to get some, some extra info or just some more reps in, basically. Yeah, the, uh, the first one Matt took, uh, there was new students there for just that class, like him and uh, Kevin, and then there were other students that popped in as a add-on to stuff that they had done with private lessons in their home. Um, that, per, that particular uh, gentleman had done the, he and his uh, son and girlfriend had done the 40-hour, uh, what I do, the idle package uh, in defense of life. It's a 40-hour in-your-home program that... Um, Handgun one, handgun two, so you've been shot, intro to long guns for home defense, uh, you know. So um, he had had a decent amount of classroom time, dry fire stuff, but he um, he got an overall view of it. He wasn't emerged in it, and he hasn't been taking classes for a long time. So there's both ends of it. So i got two questions for you. With the courses that you teach, do you have them as kind of a series where they can build on each other? So someone can start with a basic pistol and then uh, there's a natural progression where they all at some point, uh, they all kind of link? Uh, yeah, 
So I don't really teach concealed carry classes like you normally would, just the legal requirements and qualification. Uh, I, I, I don't like those classes. I, if someone's only going to take one class, I want them to get the best class possible and get as much education as possible. So what I do with my entry level class, handgun essentials one, it qualifies for Illinois concealed carry, but it's a fighting pistol class. I hit the bare minimum on the legal stuff that meets the requirements for, um, Illinois state police. And the rest of the time is a minimum of four hours on the range. And I'm, tr I'm always trying to eke out more time on the range. And essentially it's a, um, base level fighting pistol course. Uh, Illinois doesn't require people to shoot from the holster. Everything we do is from the holster. Um, there's an intro to movement in it. There's an intro to, um, if the class progresses quickly enough, there's an intro to cover and concealment. Um, and I really push the students harder than most concealed carry class, actually all concealed carry classes do. So um, that's my handgun one. And that leads right into handgun two, which is um, a heavy focus on cover and concealment movement. Um, significantly more uh, with um, malfunction clearance and um, some intro to low light with a lot of my classes. Um, the intro stuff that I do leads into the next class. So then after that, they would be able to, um, and they also have an intro into medical. So from handgun two, they would be able to go into a low light class or a, um, medical class with an idea of what's going to happen. So they're not taken off by it. And I, I kind of build on all of them. So yes, there, there is a, a progression to them. Cool. Now, with this specific class that we're discussing right now, how many hours is it and how many days? So right now, this version of the class that we're talking about is a two-day course. Um, 16 hours is generally what we do, um, but that can be adjusted on if there's range restrictions. Uh, so this range that we were at on Sunday – they don't want the class to end at four. They want us off the range at four. So we had, it was like 15 hours, you know, but I tailor it to make sure that everything is. So we might get a few less reps in, uh, but I also have a three day version of this class. So my three day version of this class is, um, the exact same portion as the two days. And then the third day, um, we switched to opposed. So you've been shot, which switches the course over to UTM. So we do simunition uh, and we, we fight. So um, it's not like um, a Craig Douglas or a Shiv works course where you're beating the snot out of each other and rolling around on the ground, but there is an aspect to fighting. Um, and with the opposed course, we get into um, since it's UTM, we can do it uh, at a different location or at the same location with a little bit of vehicle work, a little bit of room work. So it all adds on to it. I can also do the third day of this as a standalone. Um, so uh, I, I like to have the ability to change my stuff when I need to, to fit the course and um, the location. So Cool. Some of my favorite classes, as a matter of fact, I think I, I even say all of my favorite classes have a good mix of classroom sit down discussion and practical shooting and all that kind of stuff. How have you broken this up to be able to convey that, convey the important information and get, get feedback um, from students and discussions going and uh, range work? So for the breakdown of this class, uh, the, so far, what I have seen with the students is, yes, adults have a hard time sitting for lecture for four hours, you know, um, but during that four-hour lecture, there's a lot of hands-on stuff with the medical. Um, they get to try all the different tourniquets. They get to do the wound packing, you know. Um, if the class doesn't have a solid grasp on uh, 
clearing an airway and checking for pulses. We get up, we do that. We find pulses on each other. We make sure that everyone has their tourniquets on appropriately. We apply them to other people. We apply themselves. So we get up and we move with that. Um, I try to keep the medical education actually separate from the shooting. That way they can focus on learning the medical stuff. And then when we start shooting, they get to apply the medical stuff. The first portion of the shooting is um, heavy on the shooting skills. And then once we've got the skills down, so uh, when we start this course, um, the majority of the course is shot one-handed. The, there are a couple times where you get to use two hands on your gun uh, for confirmation of skills or if we're learning a new skill um, and the final, um, the final drill or the final test, but everything else is done one handed. So you'll start with a confirmation, uh, with holster work and, um, accuracy. So I can see where everybody's at, make sure they can use their holster appropriately and make sure that they're hitting what they aim at. I have a high accuracy standard in this course. Uh, the easiest portion of this course is the very first 30 rounds, um, 30 rounds, three mags, whatever it works out to be, uh, shoot it on a B 27 target. And we're just let, let the student do what they do. And directly after that, we go straight into one handed stuff. Uh, we'll put two hands on the gun when we do some of the movement stuff, um, just for, comfort of the student, but it's just in the initial phases of it. Um, because two hands on the gun for the movement portion of the class leads directly into the final test where they start off with two hands on the gun and have to go into move. If you need to move, use cover, if you need to use cover. So, and then throughout all of that, uh, last portion of the class, uh, probably the last, so after noon on the second day from there on out, uh, we start working on right now, the working title is around the world. Um, I don't have a, a final name for it. Um, there's another drill out there called around the world that Dave Spalding does, but he has told me he doesn't care if I use it. So, um, I may change the name of it, but it's a, uh, everything that we've learned in class is tested. So we have movement, we have cover and concealment, we have tourniquets, we have wound packing, um, we have one-handed shooting, we have malfunction clearance, we have, we've got everything that we've worked on. Um, and it takes a while to set up and it takes a lot of hands to make it work. So students are involved in the process. Um, so when we're doing it, everybody gets to go through it a minimum of two times, depending on the uh, range uh, requirements or, or range restrictions. Uh, this class got to go through it twice each time. Uh, that's my minimum for going through this because I require you to do it uh, with tourniquet application and wound packing. So uh, I put up a drill uh, on my page and a couple other pages of, of me, Demo, Dakota put it up on his Instagram page, uh, a video of his final run through it, uh, so you can get an idea of what it is. And we want the student to be stressed, but we don't want them to be frustrated. Um, and I'm right on your butt the entire time. Uh, so we have discretionary targets, we have numbered targets. Um, if we call out a number, that's the number of shots that target gets. Anytime any other target that has a number on it, if that number hasn't been called, there are no shoot. We have random no shoots put in there. And then we have pivoting targets in there um, that can change from shoot or no shoot at any given time. So it's a decent breakdown of it. So my question is for the students now. Either of you guys, I, this is gonna be one of those shotgun questions or just I'll throw it out there and you guys answer. Okay, ready. What are some of the things that you found as students in this class that was unique, that definitely stood out, why you're going to recommend this class over someone taking a different type of a pan gun class? 
So I'll start that one. A um, couple things. For one, um, the fact that emerges medical and shooting together is really convenient, right? So you cover a, a lot of really practical bases. Um, so that on its face is really cool. Um, a couple things that, well, another thing I like about it too is that, again, Eric has spent most of his professional life doing this stuff for real to some degree. I mean, he lives in Chicago, so <laughs> um, I'm sure he's had a little practice with that. Um, so that's, that's cool too. You got some really cool application there and some, some lessons learned in the field, right? Um, as for the shooting, there was a couple things that were different to me that I really enjoyed. One of them was just overall in general, um, the concept of fighting with your gun. This wasn't just shooting. It wasn't just about shooting well and efficient and all that stuff. Um, and, and I believe he, he even said so that he gets a lot of this from Dave Spaulding's fighting handgun classes and stuff like that. There's a lot of practical fighting concepts in there. One example, and this is, you know, in the grand scheme of things, it could be minor, but it made me think, um, we were doing a drill. I think it's called ping pong, maybe where you're, you're standing on the line, um, facing down range. And then you have to run to, um, uh, about 10 yards away to another cone laterally and then engage a target. Now, Matt likes to call me a gamer bearded Matt, for those of you in the chat. And, uh, I've, I've done like 10 competitions guys. I'm not, I'm not a gamer yet. I haven't earned that title, but in that particular realm, as far as I have learned, a lot of times when you go in to enter a shooting position, um, you'll start kind of stutter stepping and lowering your center of gravity a little bit sooner to create a more stable platform to get your gun out there sooner. Um, get us an acceptable side picture sooner and get a shot on target sooner. And that's all well and good. That's, and you know, that's, that's great. Um, one thing that Eric said, he goes, Hey, think about it. But, um, in a fight, telegraphing is a thing. Think about if you can make it more, a more sudden stop, a more hard stop so that their ability to react to you stopping or changing direction might be harder to pick up on. And now, it's, it's a minor thing, right? It's subtle, but it's again, thinking about the fight. That's a really interesting concept to me. And I enjoyed um, that. Another thing that I really enjoyed too, and this is something that you don't see a lot when you're doing single hand shooting in classes, because you're mainly working on that component skill. Um, we did some mirror image shooting. So that means we're doing freestyle, but with our left hand and, or well, you're not strong hand, not primary hand. And, uh, on its face, when we did that at first, I'm like, hmm, when are you going to use your, when are you going to do your grip backwards? You know, kind of strange. But um, what that did is it got us in the mindset of, hey, you might be down to the wrong hand, but you also might have some function and some use of this hand. So you use it somehow. So right now, yeah, we're doing mirror image, you know, whatever. But when it came down to going through these evolutions injured, it's like, hey, you might have this meat left on here. Why don't you jam it inside of the gun and get some more stabilization, especially when you're down to the hand that you're not used to shooting with very often. So I really, I really appreciated that particular point too. So yeah, overall, man, uh, just, there was just a lot of really good nuggets shared throughout the, the class that made you think about things maybe a little bit differently than you may have had if you just went to kind of a conventional shooting class, you know. Cool. So I agree, of course, with Dakota, like everyone does. Um, totally Eric's experience and perspective working that medical side and having seen, you know, a lot of that stuff. John was another guy who was in our class who has worked that field and seen a lot of stuff. Uh, so I love to hear the real stories because it helps drive home kind of the, you know, the value or the, you know, this is what usually happens. But if you don't think something weird could happen, here's three different stories where the weirdest thing I ever saw happen. Uh, so that's awesome. Um, but for what I really like about Eric's class is it's, uh, you definitely learn a lot, but it's a great validation class for your gear, for your skills, whatever. So if I know someone who's like, Hey, I just bought a gun and even worse, like I just got my concealed carry, like, I'm, you know, everything. I'm like, cool, let's go to a class together. This is a great class because medical makes everyone just think of CPR class, which is pretty boring on its face. Right. So they're, they're in cause they're going to get to shoot and they think, okay, I'm going to learn some medical. And then it's just going to be a fun gun class. And it's like, if you're not struggling, I don't know 
how you like what you're doing. Cause everyone in that class, whether it regardless of your skill, regardless of your gear, you're fight, you're figuring out where your rough patches are. Um, so my first time around life was easier. I was running a clock 17 with an RMR. Um, but man, I was glad I had that stippling on there the first time I started getting fake blood all over it. Right. But then it was like, Eric was not hesitant to get in my window and fill it with <laughs> blood. So it was like, man, maybe RMRs do fail in, uh, nope, pull that trigger. All the, you know, liquids gone. We're good to go again. So, um, the first time around was awesome for that. And this time around I ran it with a 43. So it was like, man, yeah, I probably should have maybe put a stipple job on it or maybe had front serrations on it. Um, or yeah, I want an RMR on it tomorrow because for not just the sighting system value, but just all the other little things that, you know, consistency between guns. Then when I switch and the way I do things is just more consistent. Um, with the 43, I was running everything from five round mags to 10 round mags to a 10 rounder with an extension on it. Right. So I was figuring out kind of what magazines are truly training range magazines because they cannot function for me reliably versus different extensions and, uh, what kind of round count worked best for me for given situations. Um, so that's really what I like it for because, uh, it does that for me. So I know it's going to do it for anyone else that I end up taking to that class. Um, so, and, and you, it's just a very good, I know, I mean, Eric is one of the best students and hosts that I've worked with or, or taken classes with. Right. So everything else then is also great about Eric's classes. Like he has the most auxiliary student support stuff I think I've ever seen. He's got spare guns. He's got spare ammo. He has the water, the electrolytes, the shade shell. I mean, everything about it. It's about as, you know, seamless of an experience that you there's like, I don't know what you'd have to do to not get the full value out of it. So uh, it's an easy recommendation for me almost all the time. Thank you guys. Yeah, no, I'm a, I'm a range mama. <laughs> I, uh, I like to make sure that my students are comfortable and have everything they may need in a class. Um, even if it's not my class. Uh, so they get the full value out of their money and their time and time away from their family. I, you know, uh, you, you heard me say in class when, when we're putting up new targets and the same thing in chess class, man, paper's cheap. Time is not. Um, so I want to make sure that you guys are getting as much as you can out of these, out of these classes. And so Eric, what's your feedback for your students? How do they need to improve? No, I'm just kidding. So Basically, you, so far you've, you've explained why this, is, why this is important. It's difficult to get people into medical classes. Throwing in the, throwing in the gun part can, can influence or inspire some people to, to, to try it out. Are there other things that you've been, any of you have been doing to try to encourage people to start carrying medical or to get that medical training? Uh, yeah. So I took Eric's class, like no ifs, ands, or buts about it. I wanted something fun to get me into the medical cause I was afraid to go sit in class. Um, so I took it and it was great and it opened my eyes to, you know, the, the full breadth of what I didn't know and all that stuff. So I was like, okay, I, I do need to actually probably, uh, train or practice it like anything else. Um, but, uh, so I bought a tourniquet after Eric's class basically, and I was kind of good to go from there. And then I realized, no, you know, you're not. So the next thing I did was, uh, Jim Dexter tactically sound training is local. I just took a straight stop the bleed course with him. Um, and it was all classroom, but it's, you know, the same Jim does a great job of breaking it up with the medical stuff. There is that built in tactile hands-on good stuff. And it was um, a little larger class with a lot more non-gun people. So that was very interesting to me to see who else was coming to get this, what their perspective was. Um, and I didn't know nothing, <laughs> which, so I felt a little more comfortable, you know, talking to them or trying to help people around me kind of deal. Uh, so that was really awesome. Um, and then just kind of going from there. Um, honestly, I don't know anyone besides, uh, one of my coworkers who's just like possibly unfortunate in this world have seen a lot of accidents. So I think like after the third, like fourth car accident he came upon, he just got into carrying like a bag in his car, but he doesn't really carry on his person or anything. So, um, otherwise a couple of my police friends, uh, they carry on duty, but they don't carry off duty or they don't even necessarily throw a bag in their car. So a couple of them I've slowly been talking to about, man, like 
I don't know why you treat off duty so differently from on duty. And I think you're going to be in for a world of shock when like you might have to do something and you don't have the things there that you're used to having. Um, but it's hard cause I'm not, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I don't, I don't have a ankle kit yet. That's next on my list. Uh, I mean, uh, the weekend after Eric's class, I put in an order to NAR and got some, some more chest seals and gauze and things like that, that I've just hadn't really picked up. So I get it. It's totally intimidating to wade your way in, but it definitely, um, you know, as much as you can just take your time, but still make yourself do it is what I'm just trying to reinforce for people. Cause again, it is, it's 10 times more likely than anything else you carry in terms of a weapon. Um, besides maybe like a pen or a flashlight, you know, medical is more than likely to come up. And then, so like for me, when I, I just, you know, I was in that situation where I had no way to help someone and I couldn't leave. Right. Cause I was involved in the accident. So I'm still sitting there waiting for everyone else to show up. And it's just like, this sucks. <laughs> and luckily that girl wasn't that, or woman wasn't that hurt. You know, she just was bleeding from the head a little, but, uh, if it had been even worse, I mean, I can only imagine. So. Yeah. Um, so as far as encouraging others and trying to spread the good word of medical stuff, um, a lot of it's just interpersonal relationships, just spreading the word interpersonally. Um, I got friends who shoot and enjoy that stuff and, and friends who also, then they're not even in the shooting community or the training community there. I got a buddy who's a farmer and I'm like, dude, we've, we've sat through those, uh, you know, those, those little classes at in elementary school where the dude, you know, got his arm caught in the PTO. And it's like, why don't you have one of these things in your tractor? Why aren't you carrying, um, you know, a tourniquet in your, in your pocket. And sometimes people are like, man, a tourniquet, man, what's going, what are you preparing for? And all you got to do is just give them any, any handful of scenarios like, Hey dude, you nick a major artery minutes, you know, in the time that it would take for someone to respond to you, a professional to respond to you. It's over potentially, you know, odds are if, if we're looking at a national average for response times and the fact of the matter is, man, things are so good anymore. For a long time, I was like, man, I, I don't know how I can integrate this on my person. I'm already carrying a gun. I'm already carrying a flashlight. I'm already carrying a knife, all that stuff. And, um, bro, uh, soft T wide turn or a uh, filter flat pack stick in my pocket. It's good to go. Heck, you can just use rubber bands, you know, and hold this thing together. Uh, there's, there's, you know, I finally had to check myself and be like, man, there's no excuse. So here I am now. And, uh, looking at integrating chest seals into that too, Eric. Um, so there's that. And another way that I personally have, um, and this is a little bit isolated, but uh, the dudes in my church, I, uh, I was reached out to by my pastor to help set up a church kind of safety team or whatever. Medical was top of the list, man. Uh, got a stop bleed class in there, worked on tourniquets, wound packing, pressure dressings, all that stuff. Um, getting CPR in there too. Uh, just ordered like a big, uh, a big order from North American rescue for a little kit for the church. Just got an AED ordered things like that, you know, and the more you just like anything, the more you live it, the more you you're just about it, the more you can influence those around you to be better. And, uh, I think that's where it's at, man. I, I share a little bit on, on social media, but you know, admittedly a lot of more of that's shooting than anything. <laughs> and I'm not an insta famous guy or anything. I just, that's what I, I guess I post more about cause it's not as sexy, but that's the deal, man. If you're out there trying to, trying to get into this or, or whatever, first of all, get into it, just find a class and go do it. Second of all, if you're trying to influence people to do it, just be about it, um, carry the stuff on you and, and take, take an event, take advantage of, of a good conversation. You don't got to be intrusive about it. People are usually pretty open to medical emergencies for the most part, because they're just a little more normal because there's not really usually a lot of times there's not much intent with it. So it's not like you're talking about the boogeyman coming out and harming people. You know, it could be, you know, someone falling through a pane of glass, you know? So anyway, um, be about it, spread the good word and get out there and, and uh, get trained up. I mean, another fun thing is always just start showing people the NIR like IG feed. Cause you want to just start showing, Oh yeah. Stuff doesn't happen. Right. I've seen the weirdest and craziest, but not implausible things on that feed. And it's like, okay, Yes. <laughs> like anyone anyway, I'm, I'm talking to them, they're like, well, what are you like preparing? Like you said, you know, preparing for what? And it's like, dude, I don't know. Here's life. Here's a great clip of life. And any of those things could happen to me. Right. Like I don't engage in safe activities all the time. I drive a car, I ride a motorcycle, I do other things in my life or people around me are doing them. 
it's not impossible. That's for sure. Uh, another good one that kind of came up through um, a force on force class that someone went to for uh, Aaron was telling me was just post engagement. You know, if you do have to engage with someone, um, the optics of post event, you trying to help them versus uh, standing there are one thing, but also just, it gives you something to do, right? I mean, there, there's a lot of other value to it as well. So just being more capable uh, is another way. I just try to push it both selfishly for people and, um, you know, altruistically, depending on what kind of personal motivations they have in this world. Yeah. So on that appearance thing, um, my, my personal feelings are, and I, I agree with uh, people like uh, Masad and Ayub and, and some, uh, quite a few other people, uh, man, if they were dangerous enough to shoot, uh, I probably don't want to be rendering aid to them unless I'm a hundred percent sure that they're not dangerous, which I ain't patting somebody down. So if they're dangerous enough to shoot, I'm leaving them be. Now uh, the perception can also be switched to man. It, if bullets are coming, going outbound from me, bullets are going to be coming inbound. So there's a high likelihood of me being injured. My loved ones being injured and innocent bystanders because and, and criminals don't care they don't play by the same rules we do. So um, I'm going to help all those innocent people first before I even consider helping uh, the person that I shot. So uh, that's how I stand on that. Uh, true story. A um, couple months ago uh, with just a, it was a private, uh, the private medical portion of this class only not the shooting. Uh, a couple days after the class, one of the students witnessed a car go through the sign at a gas station and land in the gas station. And he's like, I could have helped. I knew what to do, but I didn't have the medical gear on me yet. So uh, when, when people ask you, what do you, man, what are you preparing for? Man, are you paranoid? Man, it's just everyday life. You know, it, it, it happens. Uh, yeah, a couple days ago, my toddler, uh, a two-year-old tried to cut my finger off, <laughs> you know? So, um, I mean, life happens and you never know when you're going to need this stuff. Shoot. I carry a tourniquet on me uh, when, when, when I mow the lawn, man, if I do something stupid or I'm distracted by my kid and I go to clear something out of the lawnmower. I lose a chunk of my hand or my foot. God forbid my kid gets in there when I'm starting it. You know, um, you never know what's going to happen. So you're just preparing for life because it happens. It does. So uh, some other things that I do to encourage people to come to class and to prepare in their daily life. Um, man, I give a ton of stuff away for free. <laughs> <laughs> people like free stuff. So, um, teachers, um, I, I always reserve at least one or two spots in a class for teachers to come in for free, uh, for the medical stuff and for the shooting stuff. If their school allows them to carry, um, if law enforcement, they get a discount, return students get a discount. Um, just trying to get people to understand, Hey, listen, I'm going to make this easy for you. So come take the class during the class. And after the class, uh, I always have stuff for people to buy. So you can always buy tourniquets for me. You can always buy pre-made medical kits for me. Um, if you decide not to do that, uh, once you've been a student of mine, I'm available to you anytime you need me. So, uh, North American rescue TAC med solutions, any of those, um, I will purchase the stuff for you at my discount at a dealer discount. Um, so you guys don't have to pay full price and it's a decent discount. Um, just call me, tell me what you need and I'll buy it for you and ship it to you straight from the distributor. Um, if you don't know what to buy, I, I will have a, conversation with you. Well, I'll, I'll spend an hour on the phone with you. What are you trying to do? What role does it need to fill? And let's get this stuff pared down to what you need. Uh, the last person who took advantage of it, I bought the stuff. It came to my house. I went to his work 
Um, and we put together his med kit in the parking lot on his lunch break. Um, because that's when we could make it work. And it's like, Hey, it worked out. Um, he got stuff at a good price and he was convinced to carry and now he does. So, um, I always offer that stuff up. That's kind of how I encourage people. So, so let's see here. I think it was Dakota said something, something to the, something about he was talking to someone. How, how did it go? There was, there was a train of thought here and I just completely lost. Was it my farming buddy? Was it? It was the farming buddy. Yeah. Do you see something like that? Bringing them into the whole idea of medical also helping encourage firearm use or carry. Do you, could you see it going in the opposite direction? How, Eric has been able to use people's enthusiasm for firearms to get medical. Well, here we have a medical, we have a medical need. There's also a firearms need over here. Sure. I mean, just like anything, when it comes to bringing people over on our side, you have to, you know, meet them where they are. You have to understand their context. You have to understand their life. And you don't really have to look very far for situations you know, where um, medical, firearms, uh, pepper spray, things like that could be useful. A flashlight. I get crap every once in a while from my buddies like, man, you carry so much in your pockets, but they're always asking me for the flashlight. Yeah. They're always asking me for the knife. So anyway, um, yeah, I think just using an example um, that has happened that actually exists, we have a couple st statistics in there. Um, and, and use that in a way that's not pushy. Like I'm not one, I'm not for one for being uh, pushy about anything, man. If you don't want to carry a gun, don't carry a gun, man. That's totally fine. I'm never going to um, push someone into that lifestyle, but I'm more than happy to throw out some examples as to why I think maybe it's a good idea if you're gonna, you know, if you want to take the responsibility of that. And um, yeah, again, you just don't have to look very far for some realistic examples that don't have to be outlandish. Um, to show them it might be a good idea. Um, one specific, and this is, this is a little off track sort of, but, um, carrying a gun at home, it, it surprises me how many people take their gun off at home. And I'm just thinking, man, uh, where do home invasions occur? A hundred percent at home. <laughs> right. And so to me, I'm like, dang, if I'm not in the shower or in bed, I, that's on me, you know? And, um, if, if part of what I'm thinking I need to prepare myself for is a home invasion, it would make sense to have my tools just as accessible on me inside my home as it would be outside my home. So, and you can point to all kinds of examples of, Hey, the guy, guess what? The guy came in the window that is between you and your bedroom. Oh, your guns in your bedroom. Well, have fun, man. Figure that one out. <laughs> Good luck to you. Um, it's not optimal. And so, and it doesn't take any more effort than, uh, than what it does outside and the underwear gun is a thing. <laughs> so, I mean, yeah, use your options, man. So yeah, realistic examples in the real world that actually happen related to them. That's my, my, uh, opinion. Uh, so Matt, uh, there's some questions popping up in the YouTube. Uh, oh, I have some listed. So, uh, do you want to hit medical gear expiring now or later? Oh, I'm, th that will be my next one. All right. So yeah. go ahead with, go with what you want. Uh, so I just attended a, uh, alert training. It was, um, basically RTF, which of course, right now I completely forgot what RTF stands for. Um, so that happened to me in the class first class that Matt took for me. I had just gotten done teaching it that week and I'm like, man, I just taught this. What the hell is that? Mm -hmm. uh, rescue task force. Rescue task force. <laughs> yep. Cause I just posted about it. Oh, an hour ago. So went through this rescue task force class. Um, what it is, is, well, it has some background. It's put on by alert alerts, this larger organization that's able to put on all this training for law enforcement. I've gone through law enforcement training courses. Most of my active shooter training courses have been about responding and assessing and shooting and that's it. Index. We're done. This class, we take it to the next level. Okay. 
what if we have patients or if we have victims, how do we deal with them? How do we treat them? So we went over all kinds of uh, medical aspects, which was a fantastic class, absolutely wonderful. It's something that I think every police department, every officer needs to take because it covers medical aspects that we don't get. We don't get it. And it covers tourniquets. It covers all kinds of good stuff. Well, one of the lead instructors was talking about a medical kit he carries on him at all times. And he kind of shows his ankle and kind of shows one of these. And I just kind of snicker because one of the reasons primary and secondary was started was because I was surrounded by many, many people who they just didn't really seek out uh, sources outside the immediate influence. And here they're, they're amazed by this ankle kit. Yeah, guys, I've been carrying one of those for a while. Thanks. Um, fantastic class, though. And for as a law enforcement officer, as someone who's going to be responding to not necessarily an active gunman, but all kinds of collisions, wrecks, medicals, having those basic skill sets. And yes, again, that class was about active shooter, but you know what? We talked about tourniquets. We talked about proper application. We tried them. We used them. We put them on our buddies. We applied them to ourselves. Uh, we tried various pressure points. This is stuff that people need to use. They need to try it. They need to, they need to, if your department isn't buying you stuff, you might want to start looking at buying it. And I'm slowly going to go into that expired part. Um, one of the cool things about buying this stuff you can get it. You can get, kind of get a collection of, of all your good stuff. And that's also where I'm going to want to talk about that after we talk about the expired stuff. I want to talk about your guys's lists of these are the things that you want to have in your specific kits. But after a while, some of this stuff starts to expire and it still holds value because it holds training value. A lot of times people are carrying all kinds of kit and all this, this cool stuff, this medical, whatever. Does everyone know how to use it? Does everyone know what it's for? Um, in, in the YouTube chat, uh, they were talking about, uh, what is it, like a decompression needle. Uh, are you trained to use a, a needle? I'm not. I'm not going to carry it. So the stuff I carry is stuff that I, I've trained with, that I'm familiar with. And then if I'm carrying anything that has an expiration, you know what? When it expires, it's a great time to explore it even further. But also, it's not a bad idea to maybe buy doubles so you can mess with it. You can have your, your good one that you're going to carry with you or your multiples in, in vehicles and something on you and have something that you can kind of mess with. Same with buying a, a training tourniquet. Don't be using your regular, your, your daily carry or your vehicle, whatever tourniquets as your training stuff. Have them marked. There are specific tourniquets that are specifically for training. Use them. Time yourself. It's good stuff. Eric? Um, 100%. So let's just work down the list. Tourniquets. You must have two. Uh, Dakota had a tourniquet break. Jeff had a tourniquet break during class. Now, my training tourniquets that I use in class, man, they, they, they get beat up and I just I keep them around. Uh, there's a mix of legit tourniquets and fake tourniquets. Um, so uh, they do wear out. So your primary tourniquet for use should not be used for training. So when you start off buying, start off buying two. All right. And when you eventually replace your tourniquet, then you have two training tourniquets. Um or one that may work as a backup to your primary. Um, when do you replace your tourniquet? There is no expiration on tourniquets, right? If you store them properly, keep them clean in a functional manner and keep them out of UV exposure, uh, they last God knows how long, right? Um, so when you replace them, you got to take a healthy look at that, man. If you're a cop and you're carrying it every day, just rubber band to your external vest, um, uh, on your, on your plate carrier, whatever you're carrying it, uh, and it's exposed to, uh, the environment and UV rays, I'd probably be replacing that tourniquet at any point that the Velcro looks like it's gummed up with stuff at any point where it looks like. Uh, the UV has changed the color of the material, uh, I'd be replacing that tourniquet. So if that's two months or if that's two years, uh, you just have to look at it and evaluate it. Right? 
if you've got the money for it, hell, replace it every year, you know, just because. Um, that's about it on tourniquets. I mean, they're, they're pretty simple. Um, chest oh, and, seals. and I know for a fact someone's going to ask, or there's going to be a question somewhere in the in the comments at a later time. What, what, what tourniquets? There's some really good lists put on by some very reputable companies. Uh, what is it right now? Uh, we're looking at the uh, soft T, soft T wide, and the cat gen seven. So, uh, with that, uh, real easy to find. Um, I post it on a regular basis on my Facebook page, but real easy. If you just want to stick with the tried and true, um, softy wide and cat tourniquet, uh, they're available everywhere. There are now six or eight. I forget the number. Um, I forget if it was six total or six additional. There's new tourniquets added to the list. Um, Sam is one of them. Uh, EMD, I think, is one of them. There's a whole bunch of them. If you go to, if you just search um, TCC approved tourniquet, you're going to find the list, right? And if you buy off that list, you're good to go. And no, the rats is not on there, and I will not call it a tourniquet. One of my concerns with also with uh, various tourniquets is what I want to carry on me is something that I know my coworkers or someone else is able to use. Yes. If, if I come across something, I can throw them the tourniquet or they can find it on me and apply it to me and save my life. Amazing. So with my tourniquets, when I make that decision and we cover this in class, um, I want my tourniquet to be so simple that if I am unable to apply it to myself, I can talk a lay person through it and have it applied correctly. Right. It needs to be stupid, simple. Uh, and I need to be able to explain it stupid, simple to those people if the need arises. So, um, anything else on tourniquets? Do we want to delve into the, um, black hole that is the rat's tourniquet or uh, sorry. <laughs> I, you know, I, I really want to talk about chest seals. I yep. want to talk about quick clot. I want to talk about the application of quick clot. So, uh, chest seals. Let's start first with um, the expiration. There are two things to consider with the expiration on chest seals. Uh, the sterility of the package, uh, sterility doesn't matter. If they've been shot, they're going to get antibiotics. So, in my mind, the sterility is kind of a moot point. What's more important is the effectiveness of the adhesive. So, um, if you hit the expiration point on your chest seal and um, the package is intact and you can't afford a new one, keep it. Don't throw it away. Right? If you can afford a new one, go ahead and buy a new one. Um, but really, what they're saying is this package integrity is guaranteed until this date to keep the glue fresh. Anytime the package integrity is compromised, you need to replace that as soon as possible because that adhesive is going to start drying out. Right? Um, when you're carrying your chest seal on a daily basis, uh, I have uh, the hyphen. I like the hyphens because they come in entry and exit kits. They also have a compact version. Uh, I carry my stuff in a Riker ankle kit. Uh, through a PNS group buy. The uh, back pocket will fit the compact and the standard entry and exit kit. You just have to fold the edges over and slide it in. As long as the package is not compromised, there's no harm in bending it, flexing it, folding it, right? Uh, now you're not going to fold it four or five times into a little B square just being wrapped around your ankle will do nothing to that package. Just check the package integrity every once in a while so that you know for a fact your glue is in good shape and then replace it when the expiration comes. Uh, there's, man, there's a, there's a ton of chest seals on the market. Uh, I prefer the hyphen mostly because, um, uh, their, their adhesive is top notch and, um, 
I like their packaging. You know, the rest of them get kind of big. Uh, some of their adhesives are not as good as others. Uh, my preference is the hyphen. So, uh, questions on chest seals. I got some, I got one. The uh, application. When when would you apply one? Because this was one of the things that we covered this week, which I didn't even think about. And it's like, oh, okay, this is cool. I like this. So, chest seals, when you're going to apply it, you're going to apply a chest seal to any injury on your trunk. All right. So, we have appendages, we have junctional areas, and we have the trunk. Anything from the neck down to the waist, um, that is not a joint. That is your trunk. If you get shot in the stomach, yes, your lungs are not there, but we're still going to seal it because bullets do funny things in bodies. Right? Uh, <laughs> so, any injury on the trunk, uh, we're going to seal with a chest seal. There is a, uh, a gray area for neck injuries. Do I pack it? Do I pressure dress it? Or do I chest seal it? Since we're talking about chest seals, if you are shot in the neck or somebody is shot in the neck and the blood coming out, is bubbling or frothy, put a chest seal on it. Because if there is bubbles or is frothy, that means there is air involved. And if air is involved, we need to seal it so we can start working on uh, creating that uh, positive negative pressure that our body works on for our chest. So uh, if it's bubbly or frothy, put a chest seal on it. If it is on the trunk, put a chest seal on it. That's it, It's that simple. Um, application, actual application of it. Uh, most of them come with a uh, four by four gauze in it. Um, use it, toss it. It don't matter. Just wipe away the blood from the skin, get the area as dry as possible. And then you want to center your chest seal over it. If you're using a non-vented chest seal, just kind of center it so it's got equal sealing on the edges. If you are using a vented chest seal, you want to center the bullet hole in the center of the vents. Uh, generally, there's channels running out to the edges and a circle in the middle. Put the, put the circle on the circle. Pretty straightforward. So if someone's in the market for a chest seal, would you advise that they just get the standard ones or vented? Uh, I'm going to say uh, go ahead and get the vented, right? That's my preference. You ask the medical community, it changes every couple of years, right? Um, I've made chest seals out of AED pads, EKG leads, uh, Vaseline gauze, aluminum foil. I've, I've made chest seals out of whatever. So, uh, but I go say go ahead and get the vented. I like the vented because it will um, fix the problem that is going on and it will delay a tension pneumothorax, which is going to happen eventually, right? Um, so since most lay people aren't going to be carrying um, chest decompression needles, uh, go ahead and get the vented. Uh, it's less maintenance. If you have a standard one, don't throw it away. Keep it. Just burp it like Tupperware, right? So, uh, well, shit, what's burping? You need to, when we put it on, we are closing a hole. And we are preventing an exit for air that has entered the chest. So once we close that hole and our lung starts to reinflate, it can only inflate so much because it's fighting against the free air in the chest cavity. There are late signs of respiratory distress for a tension pneumothorax. Tension pneumothorax just means that the hole is now sealed and uh, there is pressure being created that is affecting uh, body systems. So, uh, one of the signs that you'll see is tracheal deviation. So your Adam's apple or your trachea will deviate to one side or the other. 
it's going to deviate towards the affected side. Another late sign is uh, jugular vein distension. If these veins are popping out of the uh, neck area and it's obvious, um, you need to burp your chest seal. So tracheal deviation and jugular vein distension are late signs. Uh, prior to that, and what you need to be doing, if you put a chest seal on a patient, you're responsible for them because you've now created the situation that a pneumothorax will turn into a tension pneumothorax. So when do you need to burp it? All right, so uh, you're shot in the chest, and they're like, oh, God, oh, God, I'm shot. I can't breathe. It hit my lung, whatever. You throw the chest seal on. <gasps> oh, God. Okay, it's getting a little bit easier to breathe. Now that patient who had improved is now starting to deteriorate. They are starting to speak in short, choppy sentences. They are having respiratory distress. <laughs> okay. Those are early signs of a tension pneumothorax. If they get the tracheal deviation or the jugular vein distension, uh, they need a needle decompression. They need more advanced care. Uh, Provided by someone who has been trained. Yeah, not just exactly random person carrying. I just happen to be carrying a sewing needle. Right. Yeah. Uh, I got a big pen and a, and a, and a pen knife. Uh, there you go. You're good to go. So um, you need to be watching these people once you put the chest seal on. If they start having those early signs, respiratory distress, short, choppy sentences, um, or short breathing, anything that looks out of the ordinary, you need to burp the chest seal to relieve the pressure. So what are we going to do when we burp the chest seal? Okay, they're having rest for early signs of respiratory distress. We are going to grab a corner of the chest seal. doesn't matter which corner. And we're going to tell them to take a deep breath on three. I am going to, one, two, on three, you're going to, okay? And when they go, I'm going to crack open the chest seal all the way to the hole so that as they inhale, their lung is inflating and is pushing air out of the hole. And they're going to hold it. And then I reseal it and they relax their breath. Okay, so that act of inhaling deeply and holding it pushes air out and they hold it to keep the lung inflated. And then I seal it while the lung is inflated and then they can breathe, go back to breathing normally. That's pushing that air out. You may have to do that a couple times. Um, so that's, uh, that, that's chest seals. Blood clotting agents. Hemostatic. Hemostatic, thank you. Yep. So, it's not popular to say, but hemostatic agents, meh, bullshit. They work, but you don't really need them. So, uh, what the current study is showing that the majority of um, bleeding, uh, you can get the same effect of hemostatic agents with just standard wound packing. You just need to give the blood something to attach to so you can form a clot and create pressure. What are we talking about when we're talking about stopping bleeding? We're talking about creating pressure, whether it's with a tourniquet and creating 360 degree of circumferential pressure or wound packing and creating pressure from the inside out or direct pressure, right? We're talking about creating pressure and that pressure stems the flow of blood long enough for it to clot. And we need to give the blood something to attach to, to clot. So in your average person, healthy, not on blood thinners, anything will work. Plain gauze, a t-shirt, a handkerchief, Anything will work that is fibrous and gives the red blood cells something to attach to so that we can form a clot while we are applying pressure. Okay. Um, 
Now, so why do we have hemostatic agents if the other stuff works? Um, it can speed up the process. So um, I'm going to take that advantage. But if you can't afford it, don't worry about it. They're expensive. I'm talking about $2 for a vacuum sealed piece of uh, 10, 12, 15 yards of gauze versus $35 for five yards of gauze with a hemostatic agent. Um, and that stuff's expensive and it expires. So um, when do those hemostatic agents come into effect? Um, they do make a difference because they speed up the clotting process. They make a big difference in the population percentage of population that is on blood thinners. Now, uh, uh, CONUS law enforcement, you're going to uh, interact with civilians on a daily basis. So you're going to um, guaranteed run into somebody who is on some sort of blood thinner, whether especially it's in Florida, all those retired in people, Florida, right? So, it wouldn't hurt to have a hemostatic agent. Now, um, so we're going to make a difference in that. The other time that hemostatic agents make a difference is when we are, our, our, our system is compromised. So the body's natural clotting ability decreases when you become hypothermic or you get cold. I live in Chicago. It's cold six months out of the year. Um, or you become hypovolemic. You lose blood. You become hypothermic when you become hypovolemic. When you lose blood, you get cold. Okay? Boy, those hemostatic agents help with that. So I'm going to use them. Now, um, Which hemostatic agents do I like? Everybody likes quick clot. Everybody knows quick clot. It's been beaten into us. I don't like quick clot. Quick clot, designed and tested and used widely in the military. Well, what wars or what in, uh, um, theaters has quick clot been used in? Desert because that's where we're at right now. Who is using quick clot in the military? Healthy 18 to 45 year old individuals, generally not on blood thinners. We're using it in a hot environment, so we don't have to worry about hypothermia. Um, so quick clot uses the body's, um, it uses a chemical that uses the bottles, body, it enhances the body's natural clotting factor. So, uh, when our body's natural clotting factor decreases because we are hypothermic or hypovolemic, quick clot doesn't work. So, if it doesn't work, we're just using plain gauze. So, I prefer a hemostatic agent that is not dependent on the body's natural clotting factor. Um, so what are those? So we've got quick clot over here that uses the body's natural clotting factor and we have all the other ones. Um, so chemical reaction versus a, um, absorption over here, uh, shellfish based. So sea locks, chitosan, chitogauze, um, there's a whole bunch of them that use it. Allergy issues? Don't care. Okay, uh, I don't know of any documented uh, allergic reactions to shellfish um, with that agent. Now, here's the thing. It doesn't matter. Um, if you're dead, I don't care about your allergic reaction, okay? If you're alive and I've stopped the bleeding and you have an allergic reaction, guess what? I can fix that very easily. So, I don't care about your allergies, right? Uh, 
it's pointless to talk more about it. So um, if you have an allergic reaction, we can fix it. But you have to be alive for that to happen. So how those work, um, they absorb the blood and create kind of a gelatinous material um, that allows us to create pressure on the inside. It gives the blood something to attach to. So it forms a clot, right? Um, to think about it in another term, uh, vomit powder. That stuff that you throw on vomit and it absorbs it and turns into a gelatinous goo so you can use a broom to sweep it up. Yeah, that's kind of like Chitosan or, 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 or Sealox or, or those um, shellfish-based hemostatic agents. Uh, there's a couple other ones out there. X-Stat, uh, which is a giant syringe that pushes uh, little bitty micro sponges into the wound that absorb uh, what those are. Uh, we had those little uh, capsules as kids um, that had a foam dinosaur in it. And when the cat, when you dropped it in water, the capsule dissolved and the dinosaur expanded. Uh, yeah, I'm dating myself. That's the kid's version though. Right. Of the x -stat. That's the kid's version of the x -stat. It does the, the same dinosaurs. thing. You shove it into the hole and it absorbs the liquid and it expands creating pressure because pressure is the name of the game. Uh, they're stupid expensive. They're bulky. Don't even, don't even waste your time buying them. So, um, expiration dates on hemostatic agents. With hemostatic agents, we have two considerations there. One is the integrity of the package. They do consider these sterile. I don't really care about the sterility because if you've been shot, you're getting a bunch of antibiotics. So uh, as long as I'm not shoving rocks and sticks into your bullet hole, we're good. So... Um, that's the integrity of the package. The other part of the expiration is the guarantee that the hemostatic agent will actually work. So these things are expensive. And if you can't afford to replace it at that time and it's a month old or two months old, keep it, use it. Because like I said in the beginning, the majority of individuals will clot just fine with just shoving something in there to give the blood something to attach to and creating that pressure for a minimum of three to five minutes for that blood to clot. So, uh, that's, I think that's hemostatic agents. Any other questions on those? All right. Yeah, I think that covered very nicely. Um, what about just basic gauze? Basic gauze, use them, keep them, augment. Uh, so if you can afford one hemostatic agent uh, and you've got room for more stuff, buy two, three, or four just plain gauze because they work and you can use them for everything, okay? Um, they can be individually sealed in pieces of paper. They can be vacuum sealed. They can be roll gauze. It doesn't matter. What that depends on is your ability to carry it and your um, resources. So, um, for the average person, not law enforcement, fire department, military, uh, if you want to carry hemostatic agents, I wouldn't carry more than one because you're just going to get the hemostatic agent down to the source of the bleeding. And then you're going to support it with plain gauze on top of it because the plain gauze is more than effective on the um, superficial bleeding from the small vessels around it. And you're just using it to create extra pressure. So do one hemostatic agent and you can supplement the rest with plain gauze. How about the tape? Tape. Okay. Um, man, tape can be used for a lot of things. You can create a chest seal out of tape, right? You can create a pressure dressing out of tape. So, uh, a lot of the pre-made kits are going to come with a little flat pack of duct tape. If you're going to do it yourself, um, I suggest Gorilla Tape because that shit sticks to everything, right? Uh, just wrap it around an expired credit card or a gift card and give yourself plenty of wraps, you know, at least enough to go around your thigh a couple times. Um, and it's just handy to have on hand. I mean, 
Christ, duct tape fixes everything. <laughs> Uh, so once you pack a wound, you can use the duct tape to hold the wound packing in place. So um, that's handy. You can use duct tape to create an improvised chest seal, though very small. Um, you can use duct tape to secure the thick mylar packaging or the thick plastic packaging from pre-wrapped um, first aid kits to create a chest seal out of that. Um, actually, that's a pretty good segue here in a second. So you can use duct tape for a lot of things. Uh, I, I don't mind having it. It doesn't take up a lot of space, and it's very useful. Um, so you want to segue into what the minimums I recommend you carry and why? All right. So if you're only going to carry one thing, carry a tourniquet. Okay? If you're going to carry two things, tourniquet and a chest seal. Now there is a study out there that shows the majority of active shooters um, in the civilian population have random torso wounds instead of extremity wounds. Yes, that is true. Um, so you need to make that decision on your own. Uh, do you want to carry a chest seal or do you want to carry a tourniquet? Uh, but if you're getting the average of three to six injuries to the trunk or the torso of the human body, uh, during an active shooter event, uh, chest seals are more important than tourniquets, according to the stats currently. But the reason why I say carry a chest seal and a tourniquet, if you're only going to carry a minimum amount of medical. Those are the two hardest things to fake. Those are the two hardest things to improvise. Yes, we can improvise a tourniquet. But if you don't do it right, it's going to fail. Yes, you can improvise a chest seal. But, you know, it doesn't work as well as a good one. Um, so the numbers, three to six chest wounds. Well, shit, I need to carry three chest seals. Meh, not really. If you think about it, tape, right? We've got a little roll of duct tape that we got on a credit card. And we have a entry and exit wound chest seal kit. So we've got six holes. I've got my vented chest seals. That covers two holes. Now I have the foil packaging from one of the chest seals. That will cover another two holes, as long as I got duct tape. And I've got the exit kit for the other chest seal, that'll cover another two. So with one chest seal, I can plug six holes. And if I'm carrying a pre-made kit that has a chest seal in it, boy, that vacuum seal plastic on that kit gives me another two holes. So I can, with a vacuum sealed medical kit that has a chest seal, I can treat eight chest wounds. Well, on top of that too, you also have 10 fingers. So... You, you could technically plug a hole in there and plug your finger in a hole like the, like the little Dutch boy on the dam. Uh, I don't generally recommend that, but yeah, no, it, it, it might work. Actually, that does remind me of something. Um, so we had to do these assessments. We had to, they taught, what was it? Pause, not claws for our, yeah. Okay. Most of our, Protective gloves, though, are black. And we go and do that. We can't see any blood. Stupid. <laughs> Funny how that works. I, I don't we need to have a different color. You want to be black gloves are stupid. Yeah. Uh, purple, orange, mm -hmm. white, green. It, it doesn't matter. Any color but black. Yeah. You know, because you, you can't see the blood. Mm -mm. So uh, while we're talking about gloves, Gloves are super tiny, man. You can roll them up into a package this big. If it's wet or sticky and not yours, you shouldn't be touching it. Okay? Communicable diseases are a thing. So take the time to glove up. It drives me nuts when I see a police video and they're carrying a med kit and there's a shooting, whether it's um, civilian, um, criminal or their partners take the time to glove up 
there is no point in saving somebody's life if you're going to have a slow and painful death from a communicable disease. No glove, no love. Plain and simple. And they're cheap. Just don't use the food grade vinyl gloves. Actually get medical gloves. Now, another consideration with gloves, latex allergies. The majority of gloves made today are not latex. You got all sorts of things. Nitrile, vinyl, whatever. It doesn't matter. Again, if you are saving somebody's life, I don't care about your latex allergy. A lot of latex allergies are localized, which means they are hives, rashes, swelling around the site where latex touch. Not a lot of latex allergies are full-blown anaphylaxis that affect your ability to breathe. Plus, I don't care. I can treat your allergic reaction, so I don't care if you're allergic to latex. But carry gloves. They're small. They're easy. There's no reason not to. Takes up the space two quarters. So. All right, what else? Um, how to carry it? There you go. So, uh, how I normally carry it. I have a Riker ankle kit just like Matt has, um, though mine's way over there and I don't want to get up and get it. Uh, what I carry in my Riker ankle kit, I have my chest seals. I have a soft T-wide tourniquet because it packs up smaller than a um, cat. On that soft tea tourniquet, I have, since it's not a Gen 4, I have the track attachment, which is just a channel that you dump it in, uh, which uh, allows for easier one-handed placement. Um, if you carry a soft tea wide that is not a Gen 4, I recommend you get it. It's like $9. Um, I forget the name of the company, but... If you Google it, you can find it. Uh, Matt, do you know what I'm talking about? Oh, this, this Matt or the other Matt? Uh, you. Because they both, they both saw it in class. So with the channel? Uh, yeah, the track attachment for the soft tee. I'm not sure. All right. Because well, I have... Yeah, I have a soft tee right here, an older one right here. And then on my patrol vest, I have the brand new one. So, uh, if you pull up the brand new Gen 4. Yeah, and that's what I have on my patrol vest, which I do not have on me at the moment. Okay, so uh, I'm going to put down the computer. I'm going to grab it real quick. Now we, we can talk about Dakota now and his haircut. Looking good, huh? I see we got fans in the chat. It's nice. They're acting like smiling's a bad thing, man. Smile I know. makes everyone happy. You know, though, again, this being a modcast, we do need to get some of those in there. Empty, right? Yeah. So I handed this to a buddy. He hadn't messed with this yet. And he said, it's like it's on bearings or something. Yeah, that's right. Night Fighter. Love it. Sick gun, man. That's cool. I apologize for that. I should have muted it before I started throwing my uh, earpiece around. Oh, no, I didn't hear anything. We were just making fun of uh, Dakota's hair. Oh, I'm used to being made fun of. It's okay. So, um, with your soft tees, um, any generation prior to the Gen 4, let's see here, you can put this little track on there. Okay. And what that does is it allows you to just snap it in and then you can put your triangle on. One of the things I found that I did not like with the cat and I, what I would do is I would carry a cat on a flat pack on a Filster fat flat pack along with a pair of gloves in a small little tiny baggie like a dime bag. Um, that cat would pick up every single piece of lint and everything. And I'd have to, every time I'd remove it, I'd have to pull off all the lint, 
screw that. I went to soft tea for my pocket carry. Yeah. Um, I'm a big fan of soft tea, but as people found out in class, you have to practice with the soft tea is a little bit more difficult to apply one handed. That's why we apply the track to it. That's why the gen fours have a little bit thinner windless and they have a track coming on it. So uh, what do I carry in my med kit? So I've got the chest seal on the back pocket. I've got my tourniquet. I've got my scissors. I've got my uh, ARS needle and I've got a, uh, Dark Angel Medical Pocket Dark, uh, which has quick clot gloves, uh, duct tape, quick clot gloves, duct tape, and a SWAT tourniquet. Um, the SWAT tourniquet is the stretch wrap and tuck tourniquet. It's that two inch wide rubber band. Um, it's not really a tourniquet because it doesn't have a windless or a mechanical advantage. Um, but it is useful for a lot of things, pressure dressings. Um, you can light a fire with it, you know, uh, it smells really good. <laughs> um, so when I'm trying to choose my medical equipment, I, I look for the, the ones that smell the best because to me, that's what's important. That and fashionable colors. Damn right. I wish they had gloves that had sparkles. You know what? It's going to be made now. Sparkle gloves that smell like cotton candy. What about scissors? Uh, scissors. Um, take them or leave them. If you can carry them, carry them. They're helpful. Uh, in all honesty, you can shove your finger into a bullet hole on a pair of jeans and just rip it. Now, if you're a law enforcement officer, I would definitely carry scissors because uh, it's a little bit harder to rip some of those heavy duty pants. Uh, but scissors are, are, are helpful. You can carry plain scissors with a um, get trauma shears, whether it's the small variety or the large variety, but that blunted tip does help uh, from tearing up your clothes. Um, I carry the small ones just because I can. Uh, the Leatherman Raptor is a fantastic little tool. However, I will say this, uh, it does not cut coins well. I bent my blade on it, cutting a coin. That's one of the, uh, I'm bored on the ambulance and I'm going to cut through a penny. <laughs> um, okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, the cheap ones don't do it. Uh, the Leatherman will cut through it, uh, but I did bend my blade on it. But the Leatherman Raptor is a fantastic little pocket tool um, for law enforcement or EMS. No, it's pricey. $11 for a pair of good trauma shears, $60 for a Leatherman Raptor. Eh. Uh, if you use it on a daily basis, it makes sense. But um, for the average person, I just get a little pair of trauma shears. I think they're like 8 bucks on North American Rescue, so they're not bad. Yeah, for me, it's important. I have my daughter is nine years old and I never know when crafts are going to occur and to have scissors or shears with me at all times is incredibly useful, especially when they are glittery and pink and smell like vanilla. Uh, the, the other advantage of having pink scissors is uh, they tend to not walk away. <laughs> I need pink pens then. You, you, you hand somebody a pair of pink scissors, they tend to not steal them. So, um, yes, you can use your trauma shears for other stuff. Generally, you're not going to blunt them. It takes a lot of use to blunt trauma shears, a lot of use. So don't worry about using them for occasional cutting chores. What else? Oh, and Matt's showing off now. I see how he is. There's the, oh, he's got a two-tone Raptor. Nice. Yeah, I got a couple of those stashed. So, I think that really covered a lot of the bases. As a matter of fact, it got into things that I didn't think that we were going to discuss, and I'm glad we did. Um, we haven't had a medical discussion in quite some time, and it's nice to get refresher information. Um, not only that, but it's nice to hear it from a different perspective, not from military medic, but a one, one of them guys that see stateside injury on a regular basis. 
Yeah. So uh, what I'm speaking from, where my experience comes from, uh, I'm not lying when I say I've done everything in the EMS field relating to medics. Uh, that applies to my experience as well. When I started in EMS, uh, I grew up in the capital of Illinois, which is Springfield. Um, if it weren't for the fact that it was the capital of Illinois, it would just be an overgrown farming community. So uh, a lot of the stuff that we did was 120,000 was the population. You know, we didn't have a lot of gang stuff. Shootings were rare. We were lucky if we got one full arrest or cardiac arrest a month. Uh, traumas were uh, hit and miss. Um, you know, farming injuries were quite popular. Um, those big bales, those big round bales of hay will crush somebody's chest and cause some problems. Um, I've had some neat mining injury, mining um, injuries. Uh, I, I had a lot of cool stuff uh, down south. Um, also done the critical care and flight aspect of it. So ventilators, balloon pumps, all that fancy stuff. And then I've got the uh, Chicago Fire Department 911 where shit, six shootings a day is normal. You know, I'm decompressing five, six chests a week. I'm doing three or four full arrests a day. You know, it, it's that, that was standard, you know, so um, it's, I think I like to think I'm pretty well-rounded. Well, it's just the fact that it's not, it's not all gunshot wounds. It's not all explosions. It's not all that type of trauma. Are you, are you going to try to knock down that plane? It's a UFO. Oh, okay. Just saying they're real. But yeah, the, the fact that you've seen so much and you know what has worked and you can comment rel uh, from a relevant perspective on these are the medical things that you recommend, that just makes sense. This is the stuff that people need to hear. Sadly, as per the norm with some of these topics, they're extremely pertinent. They're extremely important. However, they're not the cool, sexy thing because it's not. we're not talking about... M240 Bravos. <sighs> yeah. Yep. Yep. But the important thing is the people that are listening are getting to pick up stuff and they are getting to, they're getting some insight, some advice. They're also be, they're given material that they can share with people that they care about to help influence and positive, possibly very positive, possibly very positively affect their lives. Yeah. So, uh, man, who should carry medical equipment? Yeah, Every everyone. There's no reason not to. Um, I got a, I got two, I got a two year old and a six month old right now. Um, well, maybe they shouldn't carry medical. They, they shouldn't carry. Right. Um, but just like some of my friends, uh, a lot of friends in the EMS field and law enforcement field. Man, they're seven-year-olds. Carry a tourniquet to school and know how to use it. You know, this stuff is simple once you get into it. Man, I can teach a monkey anything with opposable thumbs to run a trauma. I like to break it down to that stupid symbol level, and everybody can do it. Uh, one of the goals with the Stop the Bleed program, right? Uh, we want AEDs are everywhere and with stop the bleed. We want to get with those AEDs tourniquets, wound packing, all this stuff as readily available as AEDs are. There's no reason that every police car in America shouldn't have a stop the bleed kit or some sort of um, kit like that. Right. Well, from, from my agency, I, uh, I bought my entire department. It's not a lot of people, but it's still, I'm, I'm happy that I was able to do this. I got every officer, including the reserves, uh, uh, cat seven, 
or uh, generation seven cat and a pouch for their duty belt. One of those, uh, what do you call them? The, the hard pouches from uh, 1110. Yep. 1110. Uh, so that actually, that's one of the things that I do on a, a regular basis. I donate stuff to law enforcement. Uh, department contacts me. So, uh, so regular officer says, Hey, and we don't got anything. We don't have anything. Like, what do you need? What do you want? What's your training? I will fill the hole for you. I will buy your gear. Um, I have one stipulation. I'm only going to buy you gear that you know how to use. I'm not going to buy you a full blown kit with chest decompression needles and all that stuff. If you haven't taken a class. So if you've got no training, I'm going to give you, I'll buy you chest seals. I'll buy you tourniquets. I'll, I'll, I'll buy you wound packing, you know, whatever. Uh, uh, depending on if they've had any training at all, chest seals are, iffy because you can create that tension pneumo because you need to maintain them but wound packing and, and uh tourniquets all man i'll provide them if they want something more hey i'll come out and do a class all you gotta do is is, is host me um if you're local great i'll do it i'll do it for free you know as long as this stuff is getting out there i don't mind doing that so um Traveling uh, distances, uh, you know, as long as my hotel's covered or I'm not shelling out tons of money for it, I'll, I'll, I'll do it. So I'll give you a free class and then you buy the equipment or whatever. So. Good stuff. Well, I think it's time for... I think Matt probably needs to give his final thoughts and also plug whatever he wants to plug, including little rubber duckies. <laughs> uh, that's fair. I mean, I always got companies to plug. Uh, that's an easy day. Uh, the last thing I'd say though, there are a couple questions about, um, I don't know. I mean, we cover in class, right? Myths, why tampons are terrible choices, why belts are pretty mediocre choices, all that good stuff. Uh, so I don't know if you guys want to talk about that or not. It was just a couple of questions back. Um, but I mean, Hey, I'll plug companies all day long. <laughs> uh, I mean, my final thoughts are of course, uh, get out and get the training. Uh, I think you're totally right. People who are interested in, um, the self-reliant lifestyle to plug modern samurai project podcast. Um, yeah, do they're into medical, they're into gunfighting, they're into doing whatever they have to do to take care of themselves because when they start looking at situations, uh, and the response times are anywhere from subpar to laughable, depending on the emergency, what's going on, things like that. Um, you, you kind of ask yourself, do I want to be sitting there waiting for someone to show up and help me? Or do I want to, be able to do something to help maybe myself and even other people around me kind of deal. Um, that's where it came from for me. And that's uh, an easy topic thread that you start talking to. If someone's not in that place, if they're not willing to kind of take responsibility for themselves or those around them, then um, you know, you can try some different avenues, but I think you're fighting a really big uphill battle for that. So, um, but the same thing is with gunfighting or anything else, right? You got to train it. You got to get out there. You got to keep your equipment up to speed. You got to, you know, don't try and do more than you can comfortably do or are trained to do kind of deal. Right. Um, but just having gloves and being willing to help and being not, you know, a liability is, is a big step right there off the bat. Um, so, uh, tactical, I mean, if you're in our area, right, Eric, archetype of the gun, uh, Jim Dexter, technically sound training, um, any stop, I mean, stop the bleed is a national program, right? That's my understanding. So you should be able to find that anywhere around you. Um, foresight solutions. Honestly, if you don't run like talon grips or some stippling on your gun, go and take something like this and you'll figure out extra grip is never a bad thing. So unless you have like FN factory, you know, super aggressive, uh, texturing on your gun, if you just have your typical Glock or, or even MMP, I don't think is that good off the bat. So that's something I would definitely look into. It helps, it helps a lot. And then the same, you know, with our, you know, if you bought a slide or paid out some serrated, is, does it just look cool or does it actually function right? And then for how you use it, um, this is why I like this class a lot. That's why I like classes like this that get you out there and you can get in your reps, trying out your stuff 
and figure out what works and what doesn't work for you, right? Um, both comfort level, you know, Eric will tell you how a, a dart needle, right? How to decompress someone. But, you know, for like for me, I'm never going to be putting a hole in someone that I didn't have to. I just don't want to accept that liability, right? If I have family, maybe it's a different story. Um, he also, you know, chest darting yourself isn't really an option most of the time. So uh, it's just something that that's <clears throat> about where my progression has hit. So um, you don't have to be a full blown medic either. Right. I don't think anyone's ever preaching that it's, it's about just increasing your capabilities within your comfort level and your ability level. Uh, who else can I push? Yeah. The duck pond, if you know about that, great stuff. Uh, awesome companies. Uh, I was running a 43 with hive extensions and a uh, hive mag release. I really like their stuff. Uh, I just bought the do defense mount to be able to get a red dot on my pistol. Cause it's a big deal to me. Um, I run a TLR six cause I like having a light. Obviously it's a mediocre option compared to some other stuff like full size guns, but something's better than nothing. Um, Fairly tactical if you're looking for awesome clothes or magazines or hats. I'm a huge fan of their stuff. Uh, Modern Samurai Project. Uh, Scott Jedlinski, if you're looking for awesome training or just a great podcast, he interviews some really awesome people. Uh, Matt Lanfair was on there, so you can definitely check out that episode. Um, man, that's I'll keep it there and just flex on y'all with my B.E. Myers glow-in-the-dark nail gene. <laughs> nice. You know, it's kind of cool. Uh, pretty much most of the names that you mentioned, you know, it's all, they're all friends of primary and secondary and the good guys kind of work together and support each other. I love that. Yeah. How do you think I found Eric? That's <laughs> so like a little over two years so ago. I cool. go to my first class. It's Jared Rustin. And then I was like, cool. Scott was in two months later. I was like, now I feel up to speed on the gun thing. And I had a car accident. I was like, all right, go find some medical primary and secondary. Here's my, you know, inaudible cries for help. And next thing I know, I see a class posting for, so you've been shot medical plus gun. I was like, all right, here we, here we go. You know, let's just get it. What we need to do. So yeah. Uh, I, wonder what, we need, I wonder what we need to focus on next. Maybe driving. <sighs> yeah. Awesome. yeah. So, uh, I, I, I picked that name for the shock value, right? It works. It seemed to work. Yeah. It definitely, yeah, it, it didn't seem implausible. And it was like, well, so yeah, what, what do I do then? I don't know. Shoot him back. And then, and then what? Bleed just, out. Yeah. That seems like, like the a, alert training I just had. Okay. Right. We shot him. Now what do we do? We have all these victims. So I don't know, like, index. I don't, I don't know how many fights you guys have been in, but I've never been in a fight where there wasn't blood involved. You know, some, at some point blood comes out, whether it's from a, a, a punch to the face or rolling around on the ground at some point blood comes out so uh, yeah funny how that works for some reason i'm out of focus too i don't know what you guys did i am uh, no. sure what happened whatever oh, well I have my my handy dandy dawson okay yeah right there so that's where i need to put my face that close to the camera good uh dakota what do you have to say for yourself? What do you want to plug? What are your final thoughts? First final thoughts on the class, since that's what we're here discussing. Um, get into it. If you can find um, a location where Eric's doing this, if you have a place to host him, um, if, there's, if there's one happening near you, jump right in. Um, it's really cool to have a class. And, and uh, I'm sure there's a couple other out there, but it's really cool and unique in this space to have a class that merges the medical skills with the shooting skills. And what that's going to give you, um, on a broad level is eventually towards the end of the class, you're starting to stack those things on top of each other. Anyone can apply a, a tourniquet, um, you know, one handed with a little bit of instruction sterilely under maybe a little bit of time pressure. Can you do it when you are thinking, processing information, shooting at targets that you don't know, are going to be called out in what sequence, excuse me, what sequence can you do it while you have fake blood on you? That's still slippery and all that. Um, that final drill stacked tolerances and, and problems on top of each other and forced you to move through those, um, as they occurred. So that's a big value added piece to this class. Uh, I, uh, you're going to get very practical skills 
on the shooting side in terms of using cover, in terms of positional shooting, in terms of uh, manipulations, all those things. You're given a place to experiment with some of those skills and, and improve them there. But again, towards the end of the class, you're compounding everything and you're getting a taste for what it might be like to have to do them at the same time in a situation. So um, jumping in, man, highly recommend it. I had a great time and I appreciate uh, Eric inviting me out there, man. It was, it was a good time. Um, now, if Eric does not have a class near you soon or anything like that, it does not mean you can't jump into a med class. Go find one. This stuff is available. It's uh, pretty accessible at this point. And all this stuff is pretty simple. This, this basic trauma care stuff, it's really simple. It's just not intuitive. Um, you need to go and get some instruction on it. You need to go learn the finer points and the nuances about it to know how to do it right. And you'll be a much better um, asset to society for it. Um, in my opinion, if you can do it before gun training, get it done. Because if you're going to be on the range, you had better know how to fix accidents because they happen. They happen out there. So um, get after the med training. Uh, you know, training in general, let's, let's also remember in the same vein, um, it's not just guns. Self-protection is not just guns. Um, yeah, I'm guilty of, of putting more attention on the shooting because I'm a hobbyist, man. I love shooting guns. I shoot a lot uh, for me. About 10,000 rounds a year is what I'm going through. And it's really easy to, to you know, bias your, your dollars spent towards that. Understand it's medical. Understand it's uh, combatives. Understand it's... Um, you know, less lethal. I understand that it's also about just being a good person, being there to help others who need it, being a good enough person to walk away from silly things that could escalate into a deadly force situation. That is all a part of it. So um, broaden your horizons and, and seek out good information from good people. Support good information like primary and secondary. Um, there's also a, a ton of good uh, sources of information out there. Seek them out, find them. Um, and, and a lot of them are connected back to primary and secondary. So you'll probably have a good network there. Um, and, and yeah, tons of good info out there. Also lots of bad info, learn to sort through it, support the good stuff. And finally, I kind of touched on before, be a good person, go out there make the world better. Um, and, and ultimately you'll probably be more effective at saving yourself from bad situations too. So do good things and uh, appreciate you having me on here. I, I'm just a guy who likes to shoot. I have nothing special to offer in terms of background or anything like that. If you want to follow me on Instagram, I had Dakota Schaefer. I post shooting stuff. I post some travel stuff. I post just whatever I kind of like. So lately the flavor of the day has been shooting because I've been doing some competition stuff. So um, I'm also speaking of Jedi, I'm going to, I just signed up and snagged the last slot in this class for Omaha, Nebraska. So if you're out there here in a little less than a month and you see me on the line, say hi, love to meet you guys. So thank you. So you said that you, uh, you kind of focus on the stuff that, that you like more, kind of the we easier stuff. Same for me and carbines, carbines, that's easy stuff. I hate shooting pistols. Well, then you realize, you know what, what am I carrying with me? So going to the medical, thinking about that whole medical package. Okay. What are the odds of me actually using my gun? What are the odds of me using medical? Uh, we need, we need to take serious assessments of ourselves and our lives and what we're more likely to encounter and prepare accordingly. Absolutely. And, and hey man, just cause you're broadening your horizons doesn't mean you can't get good at something yeah. with pistol shooting. I will also, I will say that that probably carries the most liability with it. If you send a round into the public, um, errantly and, and we understand life happens, things stack on top of each other. But if you're not taking the time before the fight to get better and to sharpen your skills beforehand, man, you know, if, there's a lot of weight attached to each round, especially if it doesn't go where you're trying to put it. So um, try to be as good as you can possibly, possibly be at everything that's important within your resources and means. Yeah. Eric, before you plug anything, before you give us your final thoughts, why not tampons? <laughs> oh, and you're muted. So, uh, yeah, for some reason, my uh, responses were not popping up in the YouTube chat, but uh, myths, yeah, tampons, garbage, belts, 
garbage. Um, to pack a wound appropriately, uh, it takes, I, I think what the uh, tests were showing were 16 to 20 tampons to get the same wound packing um, uh, capabilities as a small Z fold pack of gauze. So when you think about tampons, tampons were not designed to absorb uh, arterial blood flow or large amounts of blood. Tampons were designed to absorb uh, small amounts of vaginal secretions uh, mixed with blood, skin cells, etc. Right. <laughs> So they were not designed to absorb that. They are designed to absorb small amounts of stuff. So you need a stupid large amount of them. Uh, carrying 16 tampons is not a small amount of tampons. Whereas carrying a small pack of Z-fold gauze for $2, cheaper than tampons as well, um, works 100% better. So uh, belts. Uh, when we are putting belts on as a tourniquet, yeah, you may slow down the bleeding, but we are not stopping down. We are not stopping the bleeding. Uh, when we are talking about people living the armed lifestyle, most of us are going to carry um, or on a daily basis wear a belt that is fairly rigid. Even the grave or the what's uh, what's Ernest, Lang uh, Ernest Langston's. Uh, belt that he's running the really thin one. Um, oh, I don't know. The, the great, great specialist is a thin flexible belt that has just enough um, rigid support to carry a file art, a full size firearm. Uh, Ernest Langdon has one. Uh, I forget what it's called right now, um, but they're an alternative to the, um, the Aries Aegis belt or a mean gene leather or, uh, any of the other belts that are super rigid that we're all carrying guns on, you're not going to stop the bleeding with any of those guys. At the most, you might slow it down and you'll feel good about it. You might slow it down. To truly stop the bleeding, you really need some sort of mechanical advantage, um, some way to constrict. So, uh, yeah, belts are garbage too. The only belt that might possibly work are those like two inch webbing belts um, that come free with your pants from Kohl's. <laughs> um, you, maybe you could use one of those because it's flexible enough um, and you insert some sort of mechanical advantage into it. Maybe um, I'd, I'd rather use a, a, a triangular bandage, a cravat, a handkerchief, uh, a, a shirt torn into a nice long strip. Um, I'd rather use one of those than a belt. Those would all make improvised tourniquets much better than a belt. So, uh, yeah, belts are stupid. <laughs> um, another question that was asked in a uh, chat that I wasn't able to answer for some reason besides myths. Uh, yes, I do travel. Um, I will come to you, uh, but I am located in Chicago and, um, if you do, yes, if you have a question about another trainer, I will vet them for you. You're like, okay, this class looks interesting, but I don't know anything about it. Um, if you send me a link for that info, I will vet that instructor for you. I'll look at their background um, if I can find it. Uh, and if I don't know anything personally about them, I will ask the collective, right? I will use my resources to help you vet that class before you spend your money on it. So uh, even if you're not spending money with me, I will, I will help you do that stuff. So I think that's it for the uh, YouTube chat questions. Yeah. Anything? Yeah. Um, and not only that, yeah, if, if people have questions, if you happen to be on Facebook or if you're on our forum, you can post that in the training sections uh, if you need vetting. And Eric's, Eric's on there. If there's a, an instructor that you have questions about, you know what, we can help you. And uh, it's kind of nice when we have this big network. It's especially nice when it's a big network of people that I personally can say I can absolutely trust. 
And there are people on there. If they say something, you know what? I have no doubts. So we have that available to you. So Eric, what are your final thoughts? What do you want to plug? When are you teaching next? Uh, final thoughts. Uh, guys, don't neglect the medical training. Um, it, it's significantly more important than your firearms training. Um, but when you're looking at medical classes, don't get caught up in the flashy, cool guy stuff. Um, yes, there is a time and place for rolling across the injured person and ending up in a fireman's carry. Yes, there is a place for that stuff. Majority of civilians don't need that. Okay. Um, make sure that what they're teaching is not, um, not regulated. Um, it's quality information coming from somebody who is, um, like me, a recognized educational partner with TECC, whether they're TCCC, whether they're TEMS, um, PHTLS, it, something. Um, and if you don't know what any of those means, just ask me. And I'll do it. So make sure you're taking a, 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 a vetted or quality class when it comes to medical. Um, it, just like with firearms, there's a lot of bad information out there. So... Um, yeah, don't get, uh, don't get too, too caught up in it, man. Keep it simple. It really is simple stuff. Uh, the firearms handi handling and the medical portion, keep it simple. There was, um, man, I haven't had, um, an original thought in a long time, right? <laughs> Every, everything that I, uh, teach has been taught before guys, um, I, I just seem to have a good way of presenting it to people. So, um, this stuff ain't magic, right? Um, it just needs to be presented in a way that you guys can absorb it and retain it. So, um, what am I teaching next? Uh, the next thing I got, uh, this weekend, we've got Dave Spalding coming up, uh, sold out class here, uh, just outside of Chicago. Uh, Matt Jayquees is coming up in October. Um, I've got uh, a So You've Been Shot class in Phoenix, Arizona, September 14th and 15th, I believe. Um, I've got a Oklahoma in McLeod, um, Oklahoma at Mead Hall Range. I've got a So You've Been Shot class coming up uh, in October. Um November and December, I don't have anything scheduled, but I'm working on 2020's schedule right now. So, uh, Santa's shaping it pretty well. Where can people find you? Uh, you can find me at uh, archetypeofthegun.com. Uh, Facebook, Archetype of the Gun. <laughs> Instagram, Archetype underscore of underscore the underscore gun. <laughs> so, pretty simple to find me, guys. Um, I just, uh, I just left my, uh, position as an EMS coordinator. Um, and I am doing this full time now. I have a, a permanent classroom and home range in Lincolnwood, Illinois, which is on the North side of Chicago, Kedzie and Devon, um, at shore galleries, which is going to be doing, um, a lot of my classes and I'm also teaching down in Crete and in Hinkley. Um, so I'm be doing stuff frequently on a monthly basis. I'll be bringing back the, um, open range sessions, you know, uh, four hour blocks on Fridays or Saturdays to come and work on a specific, uh, specific technique. And I'm going to, uh, start running a shooting clinic, uh, where you tell me what you want to work on, or if you don't know, we'll pick something, um, and we fix it. So I'm going to be running uh, shooting clinics uh, like that um, here on a monthly basis. So, yeah, that's about all I got. Cool. Good talk. Good stuff. Thanks, guys. Um, again, 
this is stuff that's important. This is, it's something that, uh, that can have positively or even negatively affect someone's life if they're not taking the, the proper steps to prepare. Negative being, if you don't do it, what are you going to do? You're going to use a belt. You're going to use a tampon. You're going to use a t-shirt to stop the bleed. We have the ability now to prepare. As a matter of fact, as you're listening right now, you have the ability, if you don't already have a tourniquet with you or have them available, you can go on the interwebs and buy them. Uh, that being said, be cautious. There are, there are, uh, what are they? The, uh, fraudulent, the counterfeit. counterfeit. Yeah. yeah. Do not buy your medical products on Amazon. Yeah. <laughs> but now's the time to do it. And it's not that expensive. And if you have to buy it incrementally, and I don't mean buy the windlass separately. I mean, buy a tourniquet, <laughs> buy this, buy that, buy a chest seal. Um, in the long run, let's say uh, a, a few months from now, you'll have your full kit. You'll be good until it expires. No, um, but yeah, Think about this stuff. This is, this is stuff that we can, we have the potential of using this at, at any time. And it's far more likely that we're going to use our medical stuff than we're going to be using our guns. So with that in mind, it's important Eric, to get that training. The, uh, what was the Boston massacre stat? Oh yeah. Uh, it is, if I recall correctly off the top of my head, um, there were no, if I recall correctly, there were no, um, commercial tourniquets used uh, and 100% of the improvised tourniquets failed. So this is one of those things right now we can prepare for and sure we're going to have to wait for shipping and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> and if you have to, if you have to save and buy something, do it because there's a good potential that you're going to save the life of someone that, you know, might even save your own life might and it might save a stranger but in my opinion that's worth it so please seek this stuff out get the training get the right equipment it's necessary nowadays there's no excuse not to have this stuff available immediately to you uh if you have the ability have it on your body if you prefer to keep it in your vehicle at least have something available um kind of like with with what dakota said support those sources that you found to be beneficial what that means to me is make sure you're, you're looking out for those sources that are, make sure you're looking out for those good guys. Um, subscriptions, likes, shares, comments on all these good guy platforms is really helpful. Uh, if you're a big fan of Eric, if you're a fan of Varg, if you're a fan of Pressburg or Blowers or Jedlinski or Dexter, any of these guys, make sure you're making, you make, make sure you're spreading the word. Let people know. These are good people. These are good people that people, other people need to really be listening to. If you like that pocket doc guy, dark angel, you know what? Spread the word. As a matter of fact, I just want, I bought another one of his kits not too long ago um, for my uh, external vest for work. What I had, I wasn't very pleased with. So I decided just to upgrade everything and, and get everything new. Support those sources that you have found to be beneficial. Um, right now there's a lot of really cool, cool guy, social media stuff, getting a lot more likes than the real, real deal, real world information. It's kind of, it's kind of a shame because some of these real, real world guys are kind of, uh, getting burnt out because they're not getting the support that they probably deserve. Don't be surprised if you start seeing some of your more favorite personalities or sources of information kind of fade away because you know, there's, it's just not worth their time and they can do something much more lucrative. Um, so please make sure you are sharing, liking, subscribing. Speaking of which, if you found this podcast to be beneficial, make sure you share and like, if you haven't already, you, it is overdue. You need to subscribe. We definitely appreciate any comments and or any feedback you provide. This is available in audio only on Spreaker, also iTunes and Google, a couple other uh, avenues. It is also clearly on, on uh, YouTube as we speak. We did this live on YouTube. Um, matter of fact, uh, we recently changed up software. We're using a different type of software. Hopefully we're getting better audio out of this. Definitely videos better. Uh, we're able to do the uh, Brady Bunch type of screen configuration where we can see everyone simultaneously. It's kind of nice. I kind of like this. Um, drawback to that though is, uh, well, you can't really pick your nose or eat or yeah. 
So far, so good, though. This is the second time we've used this software. And uh, yeah, I, I, I think it's been a winner. Big thanks to our sponsors. Big thanks to Filster. Um, since we've just talked about medical today, I'm going to continue talking about medical. The flat pack for your tourniquet. Um, let's see here. They have, uh, Filster has all kinds of medical stuff. Check them out. They basically make all this medical stuff much easier to carry with you on a daily basis. We talked about the need of it. It's important to carry this stuff. Filster is going to make it much more easy for you to keep it on you. Uh, big thank you to Fax on Firearms. We're all working on our guns at some point. We're all needing to replace springs or pins or you name it, especially with our AR-15s. It's not a bad idea to keep spare parts. Fax on Firearms has a lot of spare parts, but not only that, but they also have a lot of barrels. For your MMP9, it's time that you get that chameleon barrel. I know you've been looking at it. It's time. Actually, they, they kind of look cool. Um, this episode was brought to you by the letters P, P, and Q, Walther Firearms. I'm going to say it again. If you happen to visit a range that has a PPQ available to rent or to mess with or to shoot, do it. I really think you're going to be pleasantly surprised. Out of the box, I really think this is the best out-of-the-box production trigger uh, available. I believe also pricing puts this lower than the standard Glock 19, which to me just uh, it baffles me. Great gun. Try it out. If you happen to know me, I'm more than happy to take you out shooting, or you can just borrow uh, a, a bunch of the Walthers that I have. It's w well worth your time. They're very cool pistols and uh, shoot very nicely. Also rather accurate. Big thank you also to our Patreon subscribers. If you go to patreon.com slash primary and secondary, you can help support the network. We just did this huge video shoot in July that was sponsored by our Patreon subscribers. Basically what they did is they helped cover all the fees, all the, let's see here. We had, we shot so much. We recorded so much. I've put in so many hours of editing and I really enjoy editing. Um, let's see here. We also have some more video things that we're going to be producing very soon with flashlights and maybe some other pistols. We might even have some STI things coming up. Uh, we're looking at another big video shoot at the end of the year with in-range TV again. Patreon's going to help us do this because without that support, we couldn't do these cool projects and we can't provide this information to you. So big thank you. Next, let's see here, not even next week. This Saturday, we're going to be doing a podcast with several people that you probably are familiar with. I'm not going to name them along with STI, a representative from STI. And we're going to talk about where they've been and where they're going and these new staccato pistols. I'm kind of excited about this because I've heard nothing but good things with this chambers pistols pistol. I'm incredibly spoiled. Yep, That's it racking right there. Ah, oh, it's like it's on bearings. Um, I was really skeptical. I talked to Chuck about these at length, finally got a good quality 2011 shot it. I'm, I'm nothing but impressed with this. And now I hear that STI has a much more affordable 2011. It's not going to be close to my, my night fighter, but still it's going to be more affordable. It's going to be able to provide better performance than, well, what everyone else carries those Roland specials, those Glocks. Now, to me, that's exciting. I, I, I like options. I like, uh, I like to see things that work. We had, we had conversations in the past about some issues with STI can't wait to discuss this and talking to Buck, who's going to be the STI rep. He's excited about talking about this as well, because, oh man, there's some cool things coming out and there's some cool things that are available now. So that's all. Um, yeah. Make sure you like subscribe, share all that kind of good stuff. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for watching or listening, whatever it is uh, this Saturday. I don't even remember what time, but that's going to be a good discussion. I think we have Matt Little. We might also have another, maybe a Tom Spooner. We'll see. Great panel. I'm looking forward to it. Um, that's all. I'm going to go now. I'll talk to you guys later. <laughs>